Genesis chapter 9. We got at least part way through it. Back up a little bit, get a little bit of a running start at it. Let's go ahead and start with verse 1. We'll read through the whole chapter. So, so God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of, it, of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that moves on the earth, and all the fish of the sea. They are given in, into your hand. Everything or Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, that is, its blood. Surely your life, excuse me, surely your lifeblood, I will demand, a, for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast, I will require it from the hand of man. From the, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by his by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made him. And as for you, be fruitful, and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, uh, and as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you. The birds, the cattle, and every beast of the field, every beast of the earth, with you of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut, cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, "This is the this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you." Uh, for perpetual generations, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud. And I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh, of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is a sign of the covenant, be- covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah uh, who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was uh, the father of Cain, and these, these were the sons of Noah. And from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a, a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine uh, which was and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, and laid it on their shoulders, and went backward, went, went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the the Lord God of, of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. And made Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the after the flood three hundred and fifty years. So all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. All right. So just to back up, because I know we covered the first part of this. There's this blessing, right? So God blessed Noah and his sons, and said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth." Oftentimes in the Bible, most of the time I would say in the Bible. Uh, God's blessings come with a command or in the form of a command. This isn't 
uh, just, hey, go have a good time. There, there's a, a command here to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth. Right? Don't stay in one spot. Don't just huddle in together. You're going to trust me. You're going to move out, and you're going to start populating the whole planet again. They would have known that there were great populations on the planet, right? I mean, if, if you had a billion people ar around the time of the flood, then they knew of cities, and, and we already know that. That was in the first couple of chapters, just in Cain's line. So they knew of cities, they knew how to work metals, they already, you know, they, they were fairly advanced. Uh, we don't want to believe that in our time, but they were fairly advanced. And now it's their job to go and to, to do this, to, to multiply. And this is seen as a blessing. God, it says God blesses them. And really God's giving them the capability to do this. Now go and, and do what I want you to do, right? Follow my instruction. Listen, if you go into Deuteronomy uh, chapter 28, it's the, the first part of the chapter, the for 1 through 14, are all about blessings of being obedient to God's word and the blessings that will come upon you. But, and specifically to Israel, but it's implied in, and also kind of spelled out in the New Testament as well. The second part of that, from 15 to 28 in Deuteronomy chapter 28, are, are what befalls people when they don't follow the word of God. The curses, we call them. But it's what happens when we, we reject the word of God and we, je we reject God altogether. And we see evidence of that today. Now there's a lot of debate within the church all of a sudden about what's called lordship salvation. And the implication that, you know, salvation is enough, you don't have to change. That there's no requirement for somebody who's saved to change, to repent even. They don't even like that word. The problem I have with that is that Jesus preached repentance. What did he tell the disciples to do when he sent them out? Here's your message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Change your ways. Come back to God. Right? The idea that we can just be carnal Christians, that we can get saved and then just continue on in, in whatever lifestyle we had before, whatever it is, and, and just pick up our vices and go and, and go with God's blessing on our life is, is not true. He, he does expect us to change. Now, I'm not saying we all grow up in the Lord the day we're in the moment that we're saved, and, and we will have some things that we struggle with all of our lives probably especially as you became, become Christians. Those of you who were adults when you became Christians, you know, being set in your ways, and then all of a sudden, Jesus says, hey, here I am, and you say, oh my word, like, like Paul, hey, Lord, who are you? Now you've got to get to know Jesus. You have to get to know a different way of life. And you're going to struggle with the things that you had you, in the ways that you were set in before you became a Christian. Becoming a Christian as a, as a child makes it really difficult to understand that. Because we're still, we're still being raised. We're still being told by our parents to change certain things. Our behaviors are still being corrected. So it just stands to reason. It's a lot easier to say, hey, you know what? God expects me to change. And it's not just because our parents grounded into us and said, hey, you know, now disobeying me, you're disobeying God. <laughs> There's truth in that, but they didn't have to do that. When they, when from a child you learn to honor God with your ways and with your words, and and when you when you fail at that, you understand that you you pick that up a lot faster. So I, I do think that it's harder for somebody who's saved as an adult to change completely. And, and, and change their ways. But, while I don't think that that change is necessary for salvation, I think it comes pretty quick. And the desire to change and the desire to be conformed to, the, to God's will comes pretty fast. And we get to Romans chapter 10, and what, is, what does it say there? It, if you uh, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. 
Peter said on the day of Pentecost, when they said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized for salvation, for the remission of sins. So repentance is a part of it. Right? It's not, it's not just, oh, I, I, I'm a filthy, worthless you know, person. I need a change. I need a Savior. Yep, you do. But understand on your way up to the altar, wherever you're going to pray to God and ask Him to forgive you of your sin, that He's also then going to say, am I your Lord? Are you willing to change? Because if you're not, then you don't really want your sins forgiven. I mean, what's the point of asking for forgiveness of sin, knowing you're a sinner, asking to be forgiven of that, and then you're not willing to change beyond that? Just daily. And as it is, I mean, pretty much a daily thing for all of us anyways, but to stay in a, a perpetual habitual lifestyle without any struggle against it you know you you need to we need to understand there there are commandments in the in the new testament so i mean jesus said in in john chapter 14 if you love me you'll keep my commandments See, it's not enough to just go around and say, yeah, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. And because I say his name and because I, I, I do, you know, I go to church or whatever, but he doesn't really think I need to change. He just accepts me as I am. He does. But he doesn't expect you to stay there. I only bring that up because this is a, 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 a new thing for me to change. And I didn't realize how big the debate over this term lordship salvation really is within the church and and there are people who fall good people very well-known people very brilliant people who fall on both sides of that it's another one of those things like um, free will and predestination in, in the hearts of many you can't have both you can only have one or the other and i think the bible teaches both but, you know, it, it's just, you, you want, you want to know Jesus not only as your Savior, but as your Lord. Because if you don't, then, and you don't submit to that, and you don't submit to him, then on the day of judgment, I'm afraid that's who you're going to see him as, as your judge, and not your Savior and your Lord. But anyways, Notice that, though, it, it hit me today or this weekend as I was kind of going back over to, to go back quickly through what we already talked about, that his blessing is a command, a command to go and do something. It, it's not the being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth that is the blessing. It's my blessing is on you to go and do these things, so I'm going to make it possible for you to do this and for it to be done through you. The blessing is the honor of having that, right? That relationship with God, that he would choose you to do something for him. It, it's, it, it's overwhelming at times, I'm sure, to step out of the ark and, and see a barren, a barren place. To think of that then as going to be a place where fruit grows, where trees grow, where herds grow, where the animals, as the waters recede more and more, the animals are going to go away farther and farther, and you're going to see them reproduce. And then given, in the next couple of verses, the responsibility to oversee life. Not, not just you get to eat all the animals, Everything, everything's free food for you now. But God expects, just like when He put Noah in, or Noah, Adam in the, in the garden and said, "Tend the garden." He expects Noah and his sons now to tend and care for those things that are living, that have for over a year been in their immediate care, but now to watch over them as they go out. But that doesn't mean you can't have them to eat. You can't have herds, and you can't have 
you know, they become hunters as well as, as well as gatherers. You know, they went from just being eating vegetation to now they can eat the, and, and take in the proteins. And I think part of that is God's provision because the, the world around them is completely different than it was beforehand. And so the nutrients that were in the plants before are not necessarily there anymore. And you have to have now the proteins from the animals to be able to, to really be healthy and survive. And then government is established, right? If you, if you, whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man his blood will be required. That, that capital punishment rule there, given to, to men to again oversee life, right? To make sure that it's, it's lived well, that the possibility of living well is there. To protect life, that's not, you know, just go out and kill whoever you want to. That there's a restriction on that. It's used for punishment, for somebody who would just go out and kill whoever they wanted to. And so now there's a restriction on it, and man is responsible for that, and government is established there. There's a commenta- common commentary written by a, a couple of guys called, uh, their names are Kyle and Dielich. Uh, and the command, they say, the command is the basis of human government. Pre-flood authority was not, th- this kind of authority wasn't given to men. Remember when, when Cain killed Abel, God didn't appoint an avenger. He didn't appoint another ruler um, to go out and do that. And that's why then you have, you know, one in his line beyond that that says, yeah, I just killed a man because he, he wounded me. And so now, if God would say that, you know, anybody who killed Cain was going to be avenged by God, then seven times the amount of, of vengeance is going to be on anybody who would uh, come against me. So that, that government, that ability to do that doesn't seem to have been given over to anybody pre-flood at least not that we have a record of but it is here specifically you know he doesn't want anybody to say well i mean his interaction with cain what have you done well am i my brother's keeper according to this yeah we are we're our brother's keepers we're to confront we're to give direction we're to rebuke if need be and listen, it, that's a New Testament thing. Paul told Timothy that the, the Word of God is good for those things, for reproof, for rebuke, and, and for encouragement. And that's how, we should, that's how we should look at that. So we have the first, really, the, the foundation of the establishment of government for men and mankind. And again, that encouragement, as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly on the, on the earth and multiply in it. I mean, you have this command, if somebody sheds somebody's blood, then, then yes, his life should be, should be taken. Well, now who wants to have more people then? If God is saying, you're going you're gonna to face the same evil, the same violence that you faced before the flood, as your children and your grandchildren and their grandchildren grow up and and begin to populate the earth, you're going to see the sin of man come right back to the forefront. And I want you to deal with it. But at the same time, I don't want you to be so afraid of the evil that you don't follow my initial command to go out and repopulate the earth. And we have many people who kind of fall into this group now. Where... For different reasons, some it's just purely selfish. I don't want to ever have to take care of the life of another person, so I'm never going to have a child. Well, that's pretty good proof that you haven't grown up yet yourself anyways. That you can't look at anybody else and say, I'm responsible for their life. And especially a child. But many people look around and see the wickedness and the evil, the sin, all the things that are going on in this world and say, 
there's no way I'm bringing another kid into this world. And we have countries now whose birth rates are below their, de- or uh, I'm sorry, yeah, below their death rates. You're gonna, we're going to run out of whole generations of people. China's figuring that out all of a sudden. But we're going to have working generations missing. Whole age groups missing. We're to, we're to bring these children into the world. Now this is a, people are going to, uh, the other big pushback on this is, is abortion. It, it's huge. You know, we see Roe v. Wade overturn, and look at the outrage that came out. And the states that jumped right on it. All right, this is going back to states' rights. Well, most of them, before the decision even came down, had laws ready to go. Right? They didn't. They didn't have to go into debate in their in their law hall, halls. You know, their representatives and their state senators and all that. They didn't have to go there. They were already set to go to vote, or some of them went to vote just in case. And some changed their state constitutions. Here's how big this is in our just in our nation alone, from the Revolutionary War till now. Military deaths in war, wartime deaths, about 1,500,000 from the Revolutionary War till now. That's on the high side of the estimation. Some estimates are, are below a million. For, for military people to have died in our country from the establishment of our country until today. We kill more babies than that in the womb every year in our country. Every year. 1.6 million per year don't make it out of the womb. And now these new laws that they have are pushing for them to, even if they want to kill them after they've been born. There is no understanding that we are responsible for life. But we want to be responsible for death. And the idea that, that we're okay with that as a nation. And, and listen, that's just our country. There's abortion all over the world. That's just our nation. And we wonder why, you know, people wonder why we would say, well, God's going to judge the entire world. We have no sanctity of life. We, we, we do not see it as sacred anywhere in this world. But in, in the most developed, the most advanced, the, the, I don't know if we're the wealthiest anymore. We, we despise the younger generations and the older generations. I don't know how we think we're going to survive. And to be honest with you, I don't think what we would call the elites want us to. They don't want us to survive. And guess what? We're not in Bible prophecy anyway, specifically so... <laughs> Except if like it of all the reasons why God would judge the earth. Why he would judge nations. We're included in those in those general kinds of judgments. But we are not specifically involved in end time uh, prophecies as far as what will happen in the specific prophecies at the end of the earth. Just in the mentality which we saw pre-flood, the mentality of people everywhere, the entire population of the world. And, and so here's the thing. If it was only a billion people and they brought the judgment of the whole earth and now you have around 8 billion people, more people doesn't help and less people doesn't help. The mentality is still the same. Sin, wickedness, violence against our brothers and sisters, and God's going to judge us for it. And we've been warned. There's his blessing and there's his grace on, on, the, on the whole earth, on the whole population. That he hasn't already done it. The whole earth is under the grace of God. Right now. Only in that we haven't all gone to see our, our judge already. That he hasn't brought his judgment. That he's held off. 
Anyways, back to this. God spoke to Noah and his sons in verse 8. And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. So we have this covenant, this promise of God. Never again am I going to destroy the earth by the floods, by the waters. I won't do it. Now, um, covenants can be, in the Bible, both conditional and unconditional. Right, this is an unconditional co covenant, an unconditional promise from God. It, I'm not going to ever destroy this, the, the earth. I won't destroy the flesh of all the creatures. I, I'm not going to wipe everybody out again by flood of water. Now, his promise to Adam in putting him in the garden and having the two trees there, you can eat from all the trees, and if you do, man, you'll live forever. There's a tree of life right there, but in the day that you eat that one, off of that tree, you're going to die. So Adam's obedience was key to the, his covenant with God, God's covenant toward him. Right? And most of the time, a lot of times at least, we see that God's unconditional covenants have nothing to do with man's behavior. His promises to Abraham were one-sided. It was, I'm going to do this in you, through you, is unconditional. The promise of salvation, His grace, His mercy for all who will believe, this, I, you have a hard time saying it's unconditional, don't you? It's, it's unconditional to those who believe. It's unconditional to those who come. But there's a point at which we have to make a choice. And so we either have to come or we push away. And there's, again, we fall into the, to the category of cursing and blessing, just like Israel did. If you come to me, if you follow me, if you follow my words, you follow my directions, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. In the day that you don't, your enemies will take you. Well, if we don't come to the Lord, if we don't, if we don't follow him, if we don't submit to him, if we don't repent of our sin, then our enemy overtakes us. We won't be judged by our enemy or for our enemy's involvement in our life. We'll be judged by the decision we made to either receive the Lord, receive God, receive the forgiveness of our sins, or rejecting it. That's the judgment that we face. And our works will be judged. Even as Christians, our works will be judged, right? In 1 Corinthians, we're going to pass through that refining fire. Everything we did out of selfish ambition, burned up, gone away, nothing there. It, it doesn't enter into the kingdom with us. Only those things we did to glorify and honor God. Those are refined. Those go through as our rewards. They come with us. And, and, and we'll know. We'll know what was good. We'll know for sure what we did for him and what we've done for ourselves. So there's a, a, a refinement, a, a, an end, a completion of our salvation. But here's the covenant for God. Here I'm going to set my rainbow in the sky. This is my promise to you every time you look. And, and, uh, and it, it says in, in verse 14, it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over, over the earth that, uh, that the rainbow... Uh, shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which I, I set. Uh, I will remember my covenant, which is, covenant which is between me and you, and every living creature, and all the flesh in the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it. So it's not just us. That gets to see it. We look at it as a promise. We look at it as an assurance. When we see a rainbow, this catastrophe is never going to happen again. But God is also looking on it. When we see it, we know that God remembers his promise to, to never do that again. Right? We don't have any way to stop it if he decided to, but he has promised and set a sign in the sky for us to know that kind of judgment isn't coming again. 
Doesn't mean the whole world won't be judged. Doesn't mean that judgment's not coming because you go into the New Testament and the Second Peter and we see it all comes under judgment of fire this time. And he talks about in, in Second Peter that the world that was destroyed by the waters but is held together by the same God will then one day with a loud noise and, and great heat will be passed away. It's all going to go. It's all going to burn. If we can look up and see God's promise to not do what he's done in the past, then we should be able to look at the words of Peter and the warnings throughout the Bible that there is an ultimate final judgment coming and believe that. If we can look at this story and see that Noah believed God's word and got in and was saved from the judgment, then we should be able to look at the word of God, come to salvation, and escape the judgment ourselves. And we should know that it's true. So we get to verse 18, and I think this is where we left off last week. It says, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. That's an important thing. You'll notice through here that Canaan keeps getting repeated. Uh, it, it, it's the son of Ham that, that it's important to know. It says, These were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated, and Noah began... Uh, to be a farmer and plant in a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered uh, the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. There's a lot written about this little story. A lot of conjecture about what really happened. That this was probably more than just Noah drunk and naked in his tent. I don't know that you can pin any of this down. I don't know that you should hang your hat on any of it. We're only giving these details. Now part of that might be because Noah, even though he gets drunk and obviously it's not a good thing. And even though he ends up uncovered in his tent also a shameful thing for the patriarch of the family god decides to possibly still honor noah and not bring more shame to him than than is necessary it's one thing for us to know this little story this story is really about noah or not about noah being drunk and, and passed out this is about ham and his heart. So whatever went on, whatever possible more shameful acts happened, and some believe that Ham uh, did some vile things in this whole story. And to, to kind of get through all of it, you'd have to wade through a lot of rabbinical writings and extra biblical writings and professors who want to put a whole bunch of st stuff in here and, 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 and commentaries and such. And, it, and it's possible. All, any of those things, are, I guess, are possible. Whatever happened, when Noah woke up from his wine, he knew, and it says, and he knew what the younger son had done to him. So that statement right there makes people think, there was some kind of evidence there when he woke up that Ham had done something to him or with him or a whole bunch of other imagined or not imagined, whatever, things. I mean, they, they really, there's a lot written about making this a bigger story than it is. Right? I mean, we've got from 18 to 28, we, we, 10 verses, 11 verses that that tell this story and they've written whole books on it. Whatever it is, yeah, Noah is passed out, he's drunk, he's gone beyond, no, we don't even know what the, cel maybe there was a celebration of some sort going on. Maybe it was a wedding they had had uh, in, within the family. This isn't like they walked out 
of the ark and the next day noah got drunk and passed out in the tent but there's some time has passed from leaving the ark to this point because he became a farmer he planted a vineyard the grapes have grown probably more than probably multiple seasons before he's making good wine from it or whatever so the population has grown canaan is probably already born already even a man possibly and and maybe because of god singling him out he's either the oldest of ham or he uh, was involved somehow with what was going on that's that's as far as the conjecture i want to get into all this just because he's there, for some reason, God has singled out Canaan. Maybe he already had a reputation of his own of being uh, a wild child. You know, whatever. But uh, Ham decides rather than cover up his father's nakedness whether uh, and protect his reputation uh, among the family, Rather to, he chooses rather to bring shame on his father and perpetuate it. It's already shameful enough that whatever happened uh, to be in that position has happened. That's already shameful enough. But then to go and, and let everybody know about the shame or, or come out and tell Japheth and, and Shem, maybe he's already, I mean, there's a whole lot of insinuation here that maybe Ham and, and Noah's relationship at this point had deteriorated wasn't that great whatever when noah does wake up he says these things in verse 25 cursed be canaan a servant of servants uh, he shall be to his brethren and he said blessed be the lord the god of shem and may canaan be his servant may god enlarge japheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. Excuse me. And may Canaan be his servant. So this is looked at as a curse on Ham. And these verses have been wrongly used and, and insinuated that the curse was on Ham. The curse is on Canaan. And because the curse is on Ham, or they think, or people have, have said that the curse is on Ham. And because Ham, his, some of his descendants populated North Africa and probably down farther into Africa, they've used these verses to justify the slavery that was going on and the slave trade that was going on be, you know, in the Americas and, and in Europe. Couldn't be farther from the truth. This is directed at Canaan. God used one person to redirect it so it doesn't go into that part. Canaan becomes the Canaanites. Those who would be the descendants that would, you know, populate what we know as Israel now. What, the land that would be given to Israel. And when Abraham would dwell there, we'll see that he had interactions with them. But he was given a prophecy. God gives a prophecy as, the, as his people are about to go down into Egypt and become a, a great nation that the, the sin of the Canaanites was not yet fulfilled. Right? It wasn't full yet. These people would become a people who would be known for being especially vile and child sacrifice. This is the, this is the group of people, in, if you look at the entire world, you look at our nation, this is the group of people it seems these days most people want to be like. To be as vile as I can be and, and sacrifice children. And, and even if we, you don't look at it as abortion as equal to being child sacrifice, look at what we're doing to our children now. The things we want to allow, the things we want to, to teach them from kindergarten on. Look at what we want to do. And God is, at this point, giving Noah a prophecy more than a curse or a blessing, a prophecy that this is what's going to happen. 
this one is going to be cursed and he's going to end up being a servant. Now, if you go into Joshua, you see that one of the tribes of the Canaanites fooled Joshua. They dressed up. They told him they came from a long ways away. And, you know, they had moldy and, and whatever bread and their clothes were all tattered and everything. And, and see, we've heard about you. We've come to honor you and honor your God. And now they were told before they went into the land, don't make any deals with any of the Canaanites. Right? Don't make treaties with them. They need to be pushed out of the land. Well, the Gibeonites were their neighbors. They weren't very far away. They just fooled them. And Joshua, oh yeah, we'll feed you, we'll make this. You. And, you know, so then Joshua went to them after he found out and said, here's the deal. Now you're our servants. I swore to you by, before God that I won't kill you. Yeah, you tricked me. But from here on, you're going to carry our water and you're going you're gonna to split our wood. You're going to be our servants. And they agreed to it. And you see the fulfillment of this prophecy right here. Because from Shem would come the Israelites. That's the, land, that's the line that we're going to key, on, key in on here. But you see this prophecy that they would be the servants of Shem that is fulfilled right here. Or it fulfilled in Joshua. Japheth, he says, uh, may God enlarge Japheth. Japheth, actually, his descendants populate more of the earth than anybody else, than the other two. More than Je uh, Shem and more than Ham. They're responsible for the descendants that go up into northern Europe and, and into Asia. From Japheth come the Scythians. They're... they're uh, do, dominion, I guess, or whatever you want to call it, went from Ukraine all the way over to China at one point. So they're responsible. They're, they're the original Russians. So as we get through here and we start reading through these names, you're going to see some names that you're going to remember from other places in Scripture, like Gog and, and Tarshish and, and all these others. And they are involved in, these are their ancient names that... Uh, will be involved later on and in the end, in the end times. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, some of these, these nations show up. Verse 28 says, so Noah lived uh, after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. You notice he doesn't say that Noah had more sons and daughters. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that's it. He doesn't have any other kids. In, in the other list before the flood, it, they might point out a prominent child, the one who would be the descendant that we would follow, but then he would say, and he had other sons and daughters, and, and you know they were populating the earth then. They had many, many kids, especially in their long life. Noah lives 950 years. 350 more years after the flood. So chapter 10, verse 1 says, Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The sons were born, uh, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, uh, Medei, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and uh, Tyrus. I'm going to struggle through these. I'm just telling you right now. I'm probably not saying half of them the right way. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, uh, Riphath, Riphath, uh, to Gomer. The sons of Javan were uh, Elisha, Tarshish, Kitman, uh, and Dad Dadayim. From these, the coast, the coastland peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands. Everyone according to his, his language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, uh, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, uh, Hav Havila, Sabat, Sabta, I'm sorry, 
uh, Rama and Sabteca. The sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod, and he, be, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was might, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And, <clears throat> and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, uh, Kalna, and the land of Shinar. And from that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, uh, Rehoboth, Rehoboth Ur, and Kala, and Resen, between Nineveh and Kala, that is the principal city. Mizraim, oh, excuse me, Mizraim begot Ludim, uh, Anamim, Labahim, or Lehabim, uh, Naf, Naftuhim, or Tuim, Pathrusim, and uh, Kaslahim, from, from whom came the Philistines uh, and the Kaphtorim. Canaan begot Sid Sidon, his firstborn, and Hath. The Jebusites, or the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, the Arvadite, the Zimurite, uh, the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the, Can of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites uh, were from Sidon, uh, as you go toward Gira, as far as Gaza. Then as you go toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Ad Adma, Zeboim, as far as Lasha, these were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, uh, in the lands of their nations. The children were born to Shem, or and children were born to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, uh, the elder, the son of Shem, or the sons of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Lud, Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, uh, Gether, or Gether, and Mash. Arphaxad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber, and Eber, two Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day, Days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Al Almodad, uh, Shelef, uh, Hazar, Hazar Maveth, Jera, Hadaram, Uzal, uh, Dikla, Obal, uh, Abimel, Sheba, Orpha, or Orf, Ofer. Havila and Jabeb. All these were the sons of Joktan. And their dwelling place was from Mesa, as you go toward uh, Sephar, the mountains of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, uh, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, uh, in their nations, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. All right, so you have uh, Gomer uh, to Japheth, you have Gomer, Magog, Tubal, and Meshach. Uh, Gomer and, and Magog are northern Europe, probably Russia. You have uh, Togarmar or Togomar. Uh, that's Turkey, we believe. Uh, Gomer was Central Europe. Uh, Iran comes from Japheth, and Iraq comes from Shem. So those two have been fighting for a long time, <laughs> a long time. They've always had some bitterness uh, between them. But you see, they come from two different families. Um, 
the sons of Ham were Cush. Uh, that is uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, um, Libya, that northern African part. And then you have Canaan back up into the Middle East. Uh, some of these others were down into the North Africa or into North Africa and Mesopotamia area. Uh, Sheba and Dedan or Saudi Arabia. You'll see them in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, especially when the attack from the north happens, they're going to uh, complain about it. They're not going to defend Israel, but they're going to complain if you come to take a spoil. Um, and then you have Nimrod. And there's a little bit more said about Nimrod than anybody else. Pretty much everybody else is just in the in a, a list. Cush begot Nimrod. And he became a mighty one on the earth. Uh, he was mighty a mighty hunter before the Lord. This isn't somebody who was honoring God. It kind of reads like that in the English language, but it's probably more likely that he was a hunter or uh, before the Lord would mean against the Lord. Uh, he obviously uh, did not... Um, well, he was the establisher or the one who, who had the beginning of Babel, which is going to become Babylon. And when we get into uh, chapter 11, we see the Tower of Babel. This all comes at least by his previous influence, if he's not directly involved. But you also see one of the other cities. He leaves from that area and goes to the land uh, of Assyria. So he goes from Shinar, from that plain, and establishing those cities in Babel, to Assyria and built Nineveh. Now, Babylon and Nineveh are the two that we're going to see later on in the, in the Bible, in the history of Israel, that took Israel captive again. When they had disobeyed God, these are the two big enemies that would that would come back against Israel and be part of their captivity and lead them away. Um, I'm not sure if I, I might have skipped over Tarshish already, but Tarshish, again, the familiar, yeah, it was in verse 4, familiar city or familiar area because that's where Jonah was heading to, right? He didn't want to go to Nineveh and bring the word of God and the, and the prophecies of God of destruction coming to them. He, it, they were his enemy, good on them, right? They deserve it, they should have it. I'm not going to go and give them any kind of warning. And we find out in that book of Jonah that it's because he knows God is a gracious God and that if they were to repent, he would relent, which he did, right? We, we know, they went in, he just went in, walked through the city for three days saying, 40 days, you're toast, and, and, and that's it. It was no, hey, if you repent, God will forgive. There's no turn to God. There's no, here's the Messiah coming, and here's all the, nothing. Just 30 days, or I'm sorry, 40 days, and you're, you guys are toast. And they all repent. They all believe him. And, and the king, sackcloth and ashes, takes off all his royal garments. Even cover the animals in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes, he says. The whole city needs to repent. And when God doesn't bring the judgment, Jonah gets mad. He's like, man, I've been in the fish for three days and three nights, which you also find out in the story. That's because of his own stubbornness and his own unwillingness to repent. But even in that, he comes out, he gets you know, spit out by the fish. He shows up, gives the message, and, and they all repent, and God doesn't destroy them. And Jonah's mad. And God says to Jonah, why are you mad? There are 20,000 in that city that don't know how to write their names. But again, do you think, you think the kids are important to God? A little bit? That, you know, I mean, even Jesus. There aren't very many times that we see Jesus really very angry in the New Testament. Except for when it comes to the kids. Anyone who who would bring harm, anyone who would cause these little ones to stray from me it'd be better for them to have a millstone around their neck and thrown into the sea than have to stand before me and when they come and they try to bring the kids to Jesus and they want Jesus to bless them and the, the apostles are turning them away the disciples turning the, the families away he doesn't have time for the kids Jesus is angry like angry like he was angry in the temple it doesn't necessarily read that way again in our translation but 
in the Greek, he was, he was angry. Don't you keep them from me. Don't you bring the little ones to me. Because here's the deal. As much as we care about our kids, as much as we would give our lives for our kids, our love for them does not compare to the love that God has for them. And, and if we're to see them as a blessing in our life, to have our children, to have things said of like a, a man whose quiver is full is a blessed man. If, if we're to see that, and we're given instruction on how to raise our children and care for them, God has placed on, on all of us the responsibility for that next generation. We're to see them as a blessing, not as a, not as a curse. And I know, these are some strong-willed kids, man. It can seem like a curse. It's like, Lord, what did I do to, to deserve this? Well, you know what? Go ask your mom. <laughs> She'll tell you what you did to deserve those kids. How many times in parents have you heard you say, uh-huh? My mom's pretty gracious. Just, oh, yeah, uh-huh. She didn't have to say, oh, yeah, just like you. She didn't have to do that. She just, uh-huh. My dad might be a little less gracious about it. He might say, you know what? I know where that kid gets that from. And then laugh at me, you know. So anyways, those are the cities. Uh, in verse 15 there, uh, through 18, you see the descendants of the Canaanites or of Canaan. And those are the ones that are, are listed as Israel's enemies in the land of Canaan. Uh, I've, I've heard those names enough to be able to say them. You know, the other names, I'm not going back through the list anymore. You guys should go back through the list. You notice there's a lot of names here that we wouldn't name our kids, like our fax said. <laughs> you know. Uh, Peleg, he's kind of an interesting one. There's a little a little thing toward him. Uh, it says, for he was... Uh, to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided. Uh, most think that maybe it was in his generation that the fall of Babel happened in, in the tower, that uh, the nations were created, God confused the languages, that that might be what that's talking about there. And some have suggested that Jobab, up in verse 29, could not possibly be Job, but we don't know that for sure either. Nimrod is, is in out of Babylon being this time of year. You're going to hear a lot about Babylon probably from your favorite teachers, especially ones who like hate most of what we do for Christmas and, and want to stir the pot. Uh, but he, he becomes one uh, through him that a, uh, a counterfeit uh, Messiah story is, is given. That he married Simiramis, uh, and through a miraculous virgin birth, she gave birth to Tammuz. And uh, that he, there's a story about him having died and then being raised from the dead. I think he was gored by a pig. Uh, so not exactly like being sacrificed on a cross. But somehow he was, he was raised from the dead in his story as well. Uh, and then they have the... the the Yule log that they would throw in the fire was, a, it's literally means an infant log. Put it in the fire and in the morning, there's an evergreen tree there instead of the log that was burned up. Evergreen being a symbol of everlasting life. The log going into this child, uh, representing the child, going into the judgment, that kind of stuff. But all that comes from, from this. So everybody says, well, you know, hey, all these different things, it's either it's either non-believers accusing Christians of stealing the Babylonian stories, or it's some Christians who are like, "Yeah, see, you can't have anything to do with any of the traditions of Christmas because they all have their foundation in the Babylonian stories." Listen, I uh, again, and we're entering into the to the Christmas time here. Um, Probably over the next couple of weeks, we'll take a break from Genesis and, and look at the story and look at the prophecies and, and that kind of thing of Jesus' first coming. 
we will have our Christmas Eve uh, service. But, you know, I, I know this growing up with, in, in knowing the Lord pretty young in my life and having especially my grandparents who were willing to, to give explanations to certain things like why a Christmas tree and all that. And yeah, it sounds very familiar and, and probably some of it does come from uh, these kind of traditions, the evergreen tree being a symbol of everlasting life. Um, but there's a story in Germany that that uh, has a, a better root to that than Babylon, and it doesn't come from Babylon. So, uh, listen, don't don't freak out about everybody who wants you to freak out about different things. I mean, yeah, maybe a Yule log is is not great. I don't even I. I never even understood. I still not, don't fully understand that. We never did it. We never had any part of that. Um, but man, you have a Christmas tree and you're going to celebrate the, the life of Jesus, the, the birth of Jesus. I don't see a problem with that. Um, I know, and, and again, this Tammuz was supposedly born on the winter solstice, the 25th of, no, of December and, and all of that. So we're not really, listen, you're not really celebrating the birth of Tammuz. It's not that. And did some of it get mixed up in, in Rome when Constantine wanted to bring and make Christianity the, the uh, religion of the empire and, and all of that? Possibly. As we know, he mixed up a lot of different things from the Greeks and, and that kind of stuff and Greek culture and Roman culture. And, cause he just, you know. and, and that's what happens in... And if you listen to missionaries, every time they go to a new place, that's one of the things they have to fight with is that, yeah, they'll accept Jesus, they'll accept the Savior, but they're not really willing to let go of all the other stuff. And so they kind of try to mix it all together. And that's one of the things that missionaries have to have to deal with. <clears throat> I'm going to say, pray about this and go with your conviction, whatever God convicts you of. You don't want to have Christmas trees? Don't have a Christmas tree. You want to have a Christmas tree? Have a Christmas tree. What are you dedicating this time of year to? I mean, that's the bigger thing. In all of our selfishness and all of our, our desire for stuff, it's all about gifts and it's all about what am I going to get? And oh my goodness, this person gave me a gift and I wasn't expecting them to give me one, so now I've got to go get one for them. It's not much of a gift anymore, is it, when you have to feel like you've got to pay it back? It becomes more about honoring ourselves, honoring our, uh, you know, other people around us, doing, doing more and make it bigger. And you know, you know what we're running into. You know what we're coming into. And don't, don't get so sucked into everything that we do in America that you forget about why we really do set this day aside. We set it aside for Jesus you know, to commemorate his birth. Maybe he was born this time of year. Maybe he was born in the spring. I don't know. There, there's a, Again, there's books written about it. To be honest with you, I'm at a point with this that I, I don't care anymore. All I know is we have a day set aside that we celebrate not just our Savior coming, but all of the prophecies that were leading up to that time. And God's promises being fulfilled on a day, whether it's in the spring or whether it's in the winter, on a day on a, uh, that God fulfilled all of his promises about the, the coming of the Messiah. Celebrate that. God's faithfulness to us. His faithfulness to Israel. You know? We get distracted by the arguments of whether we should or we shouldn't. We get distracted by the let's go shopping and, and beat the rush. And, you know, what store do I got to go to to find what I'm doing? Or, or do I just sit at home and, and order it all online and then hope the porch pirates don't come and steal it from me? Or, you know, whatever. Don't get so caught up into that that you really forget about why we have this time set aside. Remember the Lord. He's our blessing, right? 
He's the one who watches over us. He, he came to bring us salvation. He is what some of this that we've already looked at was, was all about. It was all a foreshadowing of him coming. It was a foreshadowing of salvation. The Enoch being the foreshadowing of the church being taken out before the judgment. All of those things. Just remember God. Honor him. Don't worry about whether people are honoring you or not or whether you've honored everybody you're supposed to and got everybody on the Christmas list. Man, somebody's going to be offended. Whether it's a family member or a stranger, somebody's going to be offended. Just get ready for it. Right? And and don't don't get ready for it like I'm ready to do battle with anybody. Get ready for it like I'm ready to forgive anybody of anything right now. Right? Unintentional. I offend somebody and you're offended. I forgive you for being offended. <laughs> forgive me for offending you. Right? Let's not be holding grudges. Let's not get beholden to each other. Let's look out for one another. Let's be our brother's keeper. Let's remind each other how much God loves them. And, and we have this special day of the year, whether you go away and visit family or whatever you're doing. Stay at home and you know hide in your hole and watch whatever's on TV. I don't know what's on TV on Christmas. I don't, I don't have any idea. Anyways. Um, listen. Don't spend so much time studying Nimrod that you forget to study Jesus. How about that? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and, and what you have for us, what you've given us. Lord, your, war your warnings that even in spite of an initial judgment in which some were saved, man's hearts have overtaken the world again. Or at least have tried. So Lord, help us to remember your promises that you are the overcomer. And because you overcame, we can overcome. That Lord, if we, if we truly do love you, we will seek to follow your word and, and to obey your commandments. Because those commandments show the world your love. Not how secluded or how restricted we are. But those commandments... Those is your instruction, your word shows us how much you love us and what you're trying to keep us from. Lord, help us to have good attitudes through this Christmas season and, and to make this a celebration of you and not just a celebration of ourselves. Oh, we love you and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.